the meantime, I'd love to get a sense of who do we have here in the room with us so far. Sure, I'll introduce myself, Patrick Salonius, local chapter president. Nice, I guess I'll go second. Hi, I'm Eli, I'm uh, in Vancouver, Canada. I'm a, a Net Squared community manager. I go next. I'm Phil. I'm a consultant at Real Ventures. And I uh, created and, and hosted a Rep Matters, which is an interview series focused on um, Black founders and entrepreneurs and, and investors. So that's why I'm here to talk to you guys about today. You want me to go after, even if I'm going to introduce myself? Yes, absolutely. Like very, very <laughs> and you can introduce yourself. After. <laughs> Sarah Gina, uh, CEO and co-founder of MIMS. I actually feel you guys invested in our company. So, so that's our first investor was Real Venture, actually. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I saw part of your your, your pitch at uh, Founder Fuel. I still have to look at the rest of it, but yeah. That was the beginning of us. Yeah, exactly. it was the beginning of MIMS. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so my name is Jan. I'm a PhD student uh, in bioinformatics at the University of Montreal. Nice. We have three people who are shy and off camera. You're always welcome, of course, to join us, but not required. But yeah, dive right in. I, right. I know Annalie, actually. Oh, Annalie. <laughs> Hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Annalie, and I'm the community manager at MIMS. Um, so I'm happy to be here and meeting all you all. And she's yeah. to check if I'm doing my work. Totally yes, and I'm correctly. checking in Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> if she's present. And you see, we have like the memes. We have the memes. Uh, the memes. The memes hoodies. Hoodie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thanks, Tanalee. My name is Parker. I'm um, the uh, community technology coordinator at COCO the Center for Community Organizations based in Montreal. We're a community organization that does organizational support for grassroots collectives and um, not-for-profits. And I deal with anything that's tech related. So groups needs in terms of websites, could be tech planning, it could be like CRMs or um, thinking about technology, thinking about security, data, whatever it is. Um, I'm, you know, advising clients or like, like working with them. So um, we very much favor a training approach, walking with, not doing it for them. So it's, it's, it's very much about like knowledge transfer and trying to um, skill up uh, different people who work in, in the nonprofit sector. So I've heard about, I used to run uh, the Net Squared meetups like way back in the day. And Oh, lovely. They, it fell off the <laughs> fell off the radar because it got too busy. But um, and I know Eli as well, so I'm just really interested in anything that's uh, related to community sector work, community work, technology, and thinking at, about thinking like critically and from an anti-racist, anti-oppressive perspective about technology. So thanks for having me. Well, it's our pleasure. Thank you so much. I'm sure we'll have a lively discussion. Careful, Parker. We may well put you to work later. In, you know. It'll, I think it'll be fun. Perfect. And Keanu, is she there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, sorry, it's dark in my room, so I have my camera off, but I- oh, That's totally fine. You don't have to go on the camera if you want. It's okay. I will show my beautiful <laughs> face for a few moments. Gracious with your uh, presence. <laughs> All right, um, so I'm sorry, I was- um, a bit busy during the beginning of the meet. What uh, are we talking about at the moment? We're talking about you. Just me? Okay. All right. I have no problem talking about me. So I, my name's Keani Ortega. Um, I am currently living in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm not sure where you guys are located, but um, I just set my foot into the door of software engineering. Um, I am currently practicing my JavaScript. Um, I'm part of this program called Resilient Coders, which is located in Boston. They are a community, a nonprofit community that focuses on helping um, 
minorities and people of color get into these high paying tech jobs um, wow. to increase the statistics of uh, people of color inside these fields. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, they work together just kind of um, to, uh, sorry, so they yeah, just push push people to uh, get into these um, things and change the statistic around. Okay, well, it sounds like we'll have a, a even more informed discussion today. So yeah. just uh, just so everybody knows, um, it, we'll have a, a series of questions that we're going to ask our panelists. Um, but if you have any questions, just shoot me a message first. I'll be really uh, looking out for that in the chat, and just let me know what your question is, and then I can you know at an appropriate moment um, you know kind of. I don't want to say sidetrack, but spend a moment on your question uh, with everyone. And you can ask the question directly to the panelists. So just shoot me the message first and we'll make that question happen. Um, so how about we just get this started off uh, for everyone who's here. Um, can the panelists, uh, let's start with you, Sarah. Can you just tell us uh, the, you know, your story, the, you know, the three minute version of who you are and how you got to where you are right now within tech? Yeah. So thanks. Uh, that's great. Actually, actually, what I realized that uh, we have like a tendency that is probably more knowledgeable than uh, than the panelists on the subject. So, so I think it will be great actually to 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 move that into yep. uh, uh, conversation. Um, so, uh, so my name is Sarah Jena. I'm the co-founder and CEO of My Intelligent Machines. Uh, it's called Mims. Uh, before that, because it's like the second part of my career, uh, I spent 20 years in academia. Uh, I come from south of France, uh, where I did my PhD in biology. Then for my postdoc, I moved to Montreal. I worked for eight years at McGill. Then I got a Canada research chair in systems biology at UCAM. I teach and, and did research on systems biology for 30 years uh, at UCAM. And during that time, I was like uh, working a lot with AI people and bioinformaticians, machine learner, et cetera. So, and I met two fantastic uh, gentlemen, Abdullah Ibn Nire Diallo, who was also a university professor at UCAM uh, in bioinformatics and Michael Camus, an AI specialist who was working in industry. And through Michael, then uh, I realized that you could do very deep tech and advanced research in an industrial uh, environment. And um, that felt super attractive to, to me. Um, then we decided to, to, to move and to move our research from the, from the university into a company. And we created MIMS. Um, the, the the weird the, the weird thing happening and uh, we can discuss about how come uh, so we are like three co-founders there are two men one woman and these three ones how come I'm end up being uh, the CEO of the company while uh, we're three three PhDs uh, complementary expertise uh, super high level the three of us um, actually at first what we realized is that. We, I was not the CEO. Um, Michael was the CEO of the company. Um, and uh, what happened is that we end up having this, this uh, weird way of doing things so that I was pitching why he was the CEO because I'm like better at it. And when we pitch Real Venture the first time, actually, that was the very first time. Uh, that I didn't introduce us before I was pitching. And, and I pitched the company and I remember the, the person I was pitching was Isaac at the time or Sam, Sam, I don't remember which one he was, but he asked, oh, so you are the CEO and you are the CTO and you are the CSO and that was wrong, right? So that were not the position that we had. And then I realized that, huh, how come you do the real CEO stuff and you don't have the title? And then I realized that you know, and then we had this discussion and, and very fast we realized that the things were not in the appropriate way. So we changed and I became the CEO and Michael the CTO. And everybody is super happy with that because he's more introvert, I'm, I'm more extrovert. And anyway, he doesn't want to go to cocktail and, 
and you shake hands and give cards and things like that. So, so you know, so you realize this kind of thing. But there was at the very beginning something that I felt, you know, that I didn't want to take the front. And that's something that I really realized is this tendency. Uh, probably, and I discuss a lot uh, all of that with my uh, the other uh, female CEO and leaders that I that I know that I had the chance to 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 meet over the years. That we have this tendency to just uh, shy out and and just stay in the back a little bit, and that there is something that needs to be done so that more women take the lead. Um, when you are talking about like entrepreneurship and, and being the you know the CEO the CEO of the company that you are leading, so that's that's my story and that and from there actually because you know that there are not that many uh, leaders in tech that are women and CEO of technology company, uh, then of course uh, I'm giving a lot of conferences and and, and involved in a lot of uh, diversity and equity. Uh, um discussions and and panels and things like that i'm always very happy to to do that um we had like a lot of thinking that we had to do in our company to 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 reach gender balance and we can we will discuss about that you know the different yes. things that we we try to do so that we are now uh between 48 and 51 percent women working admins so we're in you know, around the 50 percent. So mm -hmm. that's something that we're very proud of. Yeah. All right. Perfect. And Phil, why don't you give us your three minute version? You know who you are, you know, how also to how you got here. I think that the story of how you anyone gets to where they are now is always an important part of it. Sure. So for me, this is, you know, the, the, the second part of my career as well. Um, I started out as an athletic trainer, athletic therapist. I worked with elite athletes and kind of either rehab them from injuries and, or, or got them ready for whatever it is, uh, uh, whatever sport they were doing. Uh, my specialty was... I do see an Alouette's helmet in the background. Yeah, my specialty was football. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I had internships with Alouette's and whatnot. And I went to University of North Carolina, did my master's degree there uh, while working with their football team. And then um, I had a short stint in the NFL with the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, and then I went to uh, China to work with the Chinese Olympic Committee uh, and some of their teams. Um, and, and while I was there, I kind of realized that I had had this great career and, and, and that it was over, <laughs> that I wanted to do something else. I wanted to come back to my community and make an impact. I wanted to um, do something at scale, uh, you know, and, and so when I really started diving into what that would mean, I'd always been interested in sort of entrepreneurship and technology. And I came across, you know, venture capital, a word that I'd heard so many times, but knew nothing about. And, you know, once I looked at it all, I synthesized it into, you know, there's just a bunch of people sitting at a table who decide where the world gets to go, right? Uh, without these investments, uh, uh, companies aren't 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 made. <laughs> you know, there's there's other forms of funding, yes, but you know, most of the high growth companies are are injected with with venture capital. And so I came back to Montreal and I started looking for people who looked like me in this space, and there were none. <laughs> you know, for for a, for a very diverse city. Uh, um, Montreal tech is not diverse, right? Uh, 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 especially in terms of black diversity. There, there was no uh, a black venture um, uh, capitalist that I could find right off the bat. Wow. Um, and, and there are some that I've now found, but they're they were uh, more sort of reserved, I guess, not as public facing. Um, and and you know, just in tech in general, there just weren't that many black people. And so, um, as I networked my way into this space. I met John Stokes from Mill Ventures, and we started having these conversations that around you know race, uh, racial diversity, right? There's a lot of uh, fantastic pushes that have been made over the past you know five to ten years, I'd say, in terms of gender diversity, and there's still a lot of work to do on that end. But in Canada, there's been no real conversation about uh, racial uh, diversity in tech, um, and and so uh, that's kind of where uh, I wanted to come in and make an impact, and and, and from that. Um, we sort of created Rep Matters, uh, where where I went and talked about this topic uh, with with entrepreneurs and investors, um, uh, mainly here in Montreal and, and in uh, Toronto. Um, also got a, a few others from, from places as well, but really that was uh, my my entrance into the space. And um, yeah, so if I can just quickly uh, to quickly go in there, 
uh, into your little bit into your story. I mean, your real ventures kind of speaks for itself. Most people can understand that. Can you just speak a little bit about what Rep Matters is specifically? Can you expound that? Sure. So the, the mission of Rep Matters is really to increase Black participation in tech and venture capital, right? And as a core component of, of that, I saw the need for, for, for Black people to be represented, right? So that's that representation in and of itself creates an invitation for Black people to join into the conversation, right? And, and, and so there was, you know, Two, two main goals, one was that, and then the other was also to have people who are in tech and in venture capital uh, hear these conversations that they wouldn't necessarily be privy to, right? These are two black people talking at a high level about uh, entrepreneurship, about tech and about venture capital, and and also about, you know, the, the racial implications within yeah. that the black experience, the the and so on. And so I wanted people that are already in the space to, to under, basically be educated on certain topics around that and, and, and to, to you know, enable them via that information to be able to create more inclusive spaces for, for Black people to join in. Very admirable. Okay, perfect. Um, so let's go on to the next question. You know, um, you know, just contextually, why don't you continue, Phil, just to, to keep the flow going. Um, why don't you tell uh, the audience maybe just a little bit of experience in regards to, you know, inequality, equality or inequality, either that you've experienced personally or that you've just witnessed, uh, stories that you've heard, uh, things that you've, you've observed within the workplace and specifically within tech uh, yeah. in regards to, to, for instance, race and inequality or race uh, and, um and participation of blacks in the workforce in the tech yeah. world. So for me personally, right, I, I try to I try to stay away from you know anecdotal things, and I just go towards the data, right? Uh, okay. I think you know personal experience is important in terms of uh, helping convey an emotion or a certain um, uh, point of view. Uh, uh, but really, what matters to me is the data at the end of the day, because I can feel some type of way, but if you know the data shows that there's equal participation of all racial uh, groups than what I feel is just what I feel, right? right. So, um, uh, so uh, but I will say that, you know, I don't feel like I've been, you know, treated any differently for the color of my skin, specifically in this environment, right? I, I entered this environment very recently, right? Yep. Uh, uh, under a year ago and, and, and have met amazing people in this space who wanted to work on, on, on bettering this play, the, the, the environment for other, other black people. Um, what I will say though, is that, you know, uh, uh, black people in Canada have one of the lowest participation rates out of all uh, um, uh, racial groups, have the lowest pay by far out of all racial groups. So on average, uh, black people in tech make about $16,000 less than white people or Asian people. Uh, um, you know, that's a huge gap uh, when yeah. you think about, you know, uh, just wealth, you know, creation over the long term, that is a huge gap. So um, you know, there's a lack of data at the same time as I have this limited data, there's a huge lack because we don't understand why that is. Is that because people at the same level are, are, are getting different salaries? Is it because black people aren't advancing to higher levels and getting promoted and, and, and things like that? So there's a lot of unanswered questions, a lot of uh, data that we need to collect here in Canada that we are not doing. Um, and, 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 but there's also stuff that points to, you know, clear inequity in the space. All right, uh, Sarah, can you, uh, perfect, that was really great, Phil. Uh, Sarah, can you just tell uh, the audience a little bit about, um, you know, it could be anecdotal or uh, could be data-driven in terms of what you see in terms of uh, inequality uh, or equality for that matter uh, within gender within the Canadian uh, tech ecosystem? Yeah, so I think it's pretty well documented why I'm super bad at re remembering numbers, but uh, uh, when you consider the, the percentage of companies led by women, that a very low number of them get actually funded by VCs. Uh, that is not representative, representative of uh, the number of companies that are led by women. And that is completely not representative to statistics showing that companies led by women tend to actually to do better than companies led by men. So that, that, that's actually, uh, has motivated a lot of, of uh, actions uh, to be able to help uh, women in investment in, in, in companies led by women, uh, where, for example, uh, funded by Stand Up Venture, uh, which is a fund that is specifically uh, investing in, in women led companies. Uh, how could we explain that though? Um, and I think, I think, you know, Probably the same thing that uh, we see within a company, how do you attract more women 
uh, into a space is by having a lot of women already. So you go over a certain threshold and then over this certain threshold, then after you pass this kind of blockage, the, the thing that block the, the so you, you break the, the, the glass uh, roof. Um, there is something actually in investment that you can see. Uh, of course, having women leaders, it's quite new. Uh, you see a lot of uh, experienced uh, entrepreneurs uh, that are multi, you know, serial entrepreneurs. And VCs tends to say, hey, uh, hey man, uh, I know you for a very long time. What's your next ventures? And I feel confident to reinvest in you because, you know, I know you very well. You were super successful and I trust you. Now, we are not so many women with a lot of experience that are serial entrepreneurs. So, and I think, you know, like this thing also has a negative impact. So are you really trustful of the future, uh, seeing more and more women uh, leading companies, getting investment, becoming serial entrepreneurs, um, actually the VC world also getting more used of how to evaluate uh, a woman leader and a woman CEO, a CEO. And there is something here that you can feel when you're a CEO of a company facing VCs. You know, when you, when a VC talk to you, actually, he needs to, he, he likes pushing you some way to just have the feeling whether he will be able to trust you. And there is some kind of, you know, tricks and, and, and kind of relationship that they might, you know, that there is like the data thing and there is the feeling thing. Am I gonna trust you? Because I'm gonna give you $5 million. Am I gonna trust you? And a lot of men, VCs, they don't know how, whether, you know, they can trust a woman to, 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 to take care of their money and they don't know how to test them and how to push them. They're afraid actually to push on them because they're afraid that to be, you know, sued for harassment or whatever, you know? So, so, you, so you actually think that to some extent there's, there's a certain, you've, not necessarily that, they, that there's a sexism always at play, it's that they're trying they're actually trying to not appear sexist so they don't push on you. And then guess what? They choose, they can't sort of bring themselves to trust you. I, I don't think that is something that they want to do. I just think that that's something natural when at one point, you know, and, 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 and Phil will tell because he's inside the VC world. I'm like, I'm, I'm more on the other side. So I have, there is the gut feeling thing. I love this company. You know, I love this company. I feel comfortable. I'm very enthusiastic and I trust them. This gut feeling thing, I think it's something that gets educated. You know, like you, you have an experience of, uh, of dealing with entrepreneur. There is some, you know, nonverbal language about like how you interact with them and how you will feel about them, etc. When there is relationship, women, men, relationship they, it's, it's different you know it, it, it's just it's just different so maybe they are not that used and maybe it doesn't feel like that that comfortable maybe it's it's more complicated to feel completely in love because whatever you know so i think that's the new thing here this new thing that they are not really uh used to might have an impact and i can feel that you know it's it's and 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 actually having women VCs doesn't help. <laughs> like, it doesn't, doesn't change anything. It doesn't change anything because if you go, actually, I've never been with the woman VCs of a firm in front of me. It's like they want they don't want to go, you don't they don't want to take care of the woman founders because they I'm I'm pretty sure they don't want to they want their opinion to be respected because they know how what a, a great entrepreneur is and not to be biased because she is the woman the only woman entrepreneur that they yeah. have in on, on their plate right so so that makes things complicated but you know seriously i can feel there is a lot changing these days you can feel it seriously That's there is much there is many more a woman that are like uh, becoming CEO and taking the lead of their company and getting investment and 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 uh, I really see it changing. In ten years, is gonna be totally different than now. 
actually, I feel uh, just sort of a spontaneous question here. You know, do you, because Sarah, you feel things are changing. Do you oh, yeah. feel, and, and do you feel things are changing on the, on the race front in tech with right now, Phil? Yeah, you know, I think that everyone got got exposed to to a to a heavy dose of racism via George Floyd, right? Yeah, and and yeah. and you know that mixed with the pandemic and the fact that we were all inside and all had time to really ingest what what we had just seen. It's not the first time we see that, right? I still remember like early days of of sort of like internet videos. I remember seeing you know some kid get who was handcuffed get shot, right? And yeah. they made a movie out of that, right? It's not the first time we see these things. And so, um, but I do think that it hit a critical mass in terms of the amount, number of people who, who, who are caring over a longer period of time. So do I think that the world is magically gonna fix itself? No, but I think that enough people have been confronted with the truth that you know, racism isn't, hasn't gone <laughs> to, to where now people are willing to take action towards, towards that change, hopefully over a longer period of time and only time will tell, but you know, that, that's part of the work that I'm doing is trying to make sure that this conversation keeps going past, you know, this sort of displays of performative allyship uh, 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 that, that might happen around a tragic event concerning right. black people. And you feel within tech specifically, it's actually starting to, uh, you know, those are fairly societal kind of questions like George Floyd and things like that. And you feel that that conversation is indeed carrying over within oh, the tech team. A hundred percent. I mean, there's life pre and post George Floyd, like yeah. period. You know, there's life pre and post pandemic, and there's also life pre and post George Floyd, in, in, in society in general and and in tech specifically. And and I think in Canada we were delayed in terms of racial diversity, right? So there's already been movements towards racial diversity in the U.S. Uh, probably just just because there's more black people there, right? 13.5 percent of the U.S. population is black. Only 3.5 percent of the Canadian population is black, and and, and so it, it creates different dynamics in terms of how you know how quickly things are, ha happen. Uh, um, but, you know, yes, the answer is like, yes, there, I do see things changing because here in Canada, you know, who would have thought that, you know, I could just parlay my way into a partnership with Real Ventures and create uh, <laughs> an interview series, right? With I don't have a tech background. I don't have a finance background. I just have the passion of talking about what, what I want to talk about, right? So th that in and of itself to me shows a difference because I wouldn't have been able to do that five years ago. You know, not that they're not good people or or whatever the case is. It they just weren't as aware. Uh, it didn't get shoved in their face as it did with that you know nine minute execution video. Hmm. That's a very interesting comments. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I have a Hi. question for you, Sarah. So this is a uh, let's draw. We've been talking about making thing conversation data driven. So let's let's use some data here. Uh, so despite making up you know half the population, women only make up twenty five percent of tech workers. You know, on mm -hmm. top of that. Uh, women are represented, underrepresented by 50% uh, within tech as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. And women only make up 25% uh, of all technical roles uh, within any tech companies. What factors do you think are leading to women joining tech companies less? And also, especially, why are they so underrepresented uh, in the more technical roles, do you think? Hmm. Um. That's a question I ask to myself a lot, a lot, because uh, when I go to when I go to the universities and when I go to uh, give conference for um, women in tech and I see students, there are a lot of there are a lot of girls out there, <laughs> a lot of women out there. We barely receive application uh, to our job posting. Uh, and so we had like a, a lot of questioning on that. Um, actually, I think we receive more application by women than a lot of tech company because we are, we have 50% of women working at least. And I definitely think that there was like kind of an acceleration when we went over the 30% that uh, women felt very confident to come because and I can I can see that probably the the fear to go into a space where it's like a ninety percent guys, you know, because and I I totally understand them. Yeah, you, <laughs> I will there. not want to work in there, and I will think ser seriously about you know going there. So I think you know going over a certain percentage of of women uh, in a, in a company will significantly help hiring more women. Um, 
the other thing that we realize is um, we need to adapt it our application process. Uh, and we discussed a lot of that uh, with uh, students, et cetera. We realized that if you have a super detailed uh, uh, application, um, not application, a uh, posting with maybe 10 qualification to be filled, if women don't have eight out of 10, they will not apply. If a man don't have, have just two out of 10, they will apply. You know, it's like, it's, it's terrible, but that's <laughs> the reality, you know? Nothing so so, so, so we, we, we make a lot of effort to uh, reduce the number of, qual of qualification that are like really described in our posting. Uh, so that, and, and at one point we even say, okay, even if you don't have everything, just apply. Okay, and we'll discuss about it because we wanted to, to have like more women applying. Um, so I don't have the answer about, you know, that I think all that maybe contribute to the fact that uh, women are not uh, going into uh, tech. Um, also, I think there is, there is a, a, a misconception of what the private sector is. A lot of women are are very conscious about like uh, the equilibrium, like family work, probably more than men still. Uh, even if things are, are are changing, they're probably um, there is a false conception that private sector and and industry is like more aggressive and you require more time than academia or any like uh, professorship position. Probably it's true to a certain extent, but uh, things are changing. And actually, and maybe Phil will, will, will agree on that, but the fact that there is such a lack of, uh, of talent in tech will, I think, um, improve a lot of things. First of all, employers need to have better conditions to allow their employees to have a better balance in life, just because they need to attract talent, they need to increase retention rate of talent. And we cannot find the talent we want in Canada. So seriously, we're hiring everywhere. <laughs> so we are hiring and you know, like there is, you know, Africa and North Africa is really, really a place to hire people. <laughs> so uh, Asia, et cetera. So there is a lot of, of uh, of um, of people that are coming from outside coming in Canada because of the attraction of tech and the fact that we are really eager to 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 have more talent coming in, so probably this uh, will um, will have an impact, positive impact on on diversity within well, companies. Well, it sounds like you're taking a very active a position to try to encourage that. It's not something that you're kind of sitting on your hands yeah. and hoping it just kind of happens. You're 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 going yeah, out and being conscious about actually it. i'm an immigrant myself right i'm french right. so yeah. you know i'm more an audible uh <laughs> minority <laughs> than really a, a visible minority but still you know my that's a cultural thing my 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 parents are italian they were immigrants in france and i'm an immigrant in canada and then you know you have families of immigrants and actually at means and that's that's when you were discussing about that, like uh, Anali, like a few days ago. I think out of thirty-four employees, we probably have three Quebecer, <laughs> you know, like born, raised with parents, born, raised in Quebec. I think there are like two or three. The rest are all immigrants, like first, second generation, a lot first generation, uh, and 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 they are like everybody. No, I know she's like second generation from Filipino yeah. you and Algeria. Uh, you know, my co-founder is from Guinea. Uh, Michael is from France, like me. So, so we are like from all over the place. So, and that's a tendency in the tech world because because of the the need of uh, relying on immigration to to acquire talent that we need to run our company. Hmm. All right. So I have a quick question for you, Phil. Um, you know, switching gears now to race. You know, a lot of tech companies do hire, uh, do struggle in the same way that they struggle to hire enough women. 
a lot of tech companies struggle to hire enough uh, people of color. Um, just to give one statistic here, this one is uh, especially egregious. Um, you know, at Google, for instance, uh, less than 4% of their current workforce is African American. And, you know, as you mentioned earlier, African Americans make up 13.5% of the US population. And, you know, that's a very stark statistic, but it's repeated really right across tech. Um, uh, you know, in, in 2014, for instance, 83% uh, of Google's employees were men and 60% were white. Um, and, you know, things have not really changed in the years since, you know, what, what do you think is causing companies to struggle so much uh, with representing the diverse societies that they're selling into within their own companies? Yeah, I, I think that um, if I could sum it up in one word, it would be elitism. Right. Uh, uh, Google's hiring practices uh, were terrible, honestly. <laughs> you know, it, it came to light that they were that, that they're historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs, where a lot of uh, uh, black African Americans go and get amazing educations, were on the check off list, not check on list, check off list for hiring, right? They were not, Google was not hiring from those places. And now obviously since everything's happened and, and it's become more of a thing, now they've reversed course, they're investing in, in relationships with HBCUs, making sure they hire and create an internship things and doing the things that are necessary to hire black talent because black talent is there, right? So uh, it, it's a combination of things, but when an, an, a huge entity like Google says, we are not hiring from this place, you know, there's just less incentive to go into tech at all when you look at it down the line, because it's like, okay, well, where are we going to get hired if I, you know, if, when it, if it's that or go and be an engineer uh, uh, or go and be a doctor or, you know, immigrants who are not getting into tech will go into these other <laughs> areas, right? Uh, think of healthcare here in Canada, right? How many, uh, you know, black healthcare workers do you know? Tons, you know, same thing with Filipinos, for example, how many, tons of Filipino healthcare workers, because they know they're going to get jobs there. Right. And so it, it comes down to sort of that critical mass that, that Sarah was talking about is just, you know, if that critical mass isn't there, they don't see themselves represented. And, and therefore, it's, it's, it's not it's not only not an invitation, it's a disinvitation. It's saying you don't really matter to us. We're not going to create anything for you. And, and, and why would uh, me as a black person, why would I go into that space if I'm not welcome there? You know, uh, uh, so so th it's very complex. There's a lot of barriers uh, that have to be worked through. But if everyone, you know, takes responsibility for their, their part of it, right? Early education, right? You need to get black kids into STEM instead of rerouting them away from STEM. In the public school system here in Quebec, they route black kids away from STEM. And this is anecdotal, yes, but I've heard from many different people, right? Yeah. And, 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 and so schools need to take responsibility for that. Universities need to make sure that they're recruiting from various schools right not just the sort of elite cjeps or whatever the case is and 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 so on and so on right then employers need to make sure that their uh, their their pipeline isn't just from you know mcgill right <laughs> how many right. Back are mcgill not that many you know so you got to be hiring from everywhere and then vcs right need to be making sure that they are purposefully setting standards for okay it, you know you need to be this this amount you know, diverse in these different criteria for us to invest in you and so on. And it goes up the chain again to the LPs who invest into the venture capital firms. They should be making the same demands as well. And so it's about educating everyone on what they're, what they're, you can't make someone take responsibility, but you can encourage them to. You can tell them, here's the problem. Here's the opportunity to fix that problem. And it is a huge opportunity in tech. We can literally change, you know, uh, the, the wealth gap in, in, in Canada by uh, between black and let's say white people opposite spectrums of the, of the wealth gap here in Canada by focusing on tech and by inv inviting black people into tech and by making sure that they have the skills to thrive and, 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 to, and to move up the chain. And you know what, I think uh, we'll definitely be getting into some of the benefits and not just at a societal level, but also even just the corporate level, a little less altruistically, even just, you know, how does this make a company stronger when they have a more diverse workforce? You know, yeah. I, one thing you brought up, and this is an interesting question, though, Phil, you said, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about Google, and it's, it's an obvious one because it's an, a company that has failed quite profoundly in, in, in creating a diverse workforce. What would the what would you say? Do you say that those same kind of elitist trends are even true within smaller startups? Um, you know, that's an interesting question. I'm curious what your take is on it. You know, um, 
I think that it depends. I think the smaller startups don't necessarily have a say, right? They're competing with Google. And so it's like the, the top tier talent is going to go to Google, <laughs> you know, uh, 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 the top tier talent, right? And, and so I think it really depends on the individual culture. Uh, startups have such different cultures. I can't, you know, blanket like like all, all early stage startups are like this. It really depends on who's creating that company. And that's why it's so important to have diverse people founding and leading companies. That is why it is so important. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's a choice. That's a, that's something that needs to be decided yep. by the leaders and be forced by the leader. I, I got, uh, we were at the Google Accelerator uh, a quarter ago, and, and we had a chance to, to meet uh, fantastic uh, female leaders. Uh, we met uh, Meg Whitman, uh, who was the CEO of Aulet Packard and eBay, and mm -hmm. such an incredible woman. And when she was starting Aylet Packard, she, she told us, I think it was Aylet Packard, she said that she wanted uh, to have a diverse board. And then she asked her, um, I don't remember the person that she has, or um, the chair of the board to say, okay, I want to have like three Latinos and, and three uh, color people and like three women on, on my board. And they came back and say, okay, we cannot find any like forget it you will have all white blah blah blah. say the board will not happen i want that that's it you you have to find so here are all the the magazine of the more influential people and please find the person i want and at the end of the day they found it but you need to you know make effort you know like you need to try and Be look conscious. for them specifically and, and and find them and and hire them so this is not gonna be easy this is this needs to be like this will require an effort at the same time, but this will have like to go from the top and say, okay, you need to have the leader say, okay, that's it. Now I want my company to be gender balanced and I need to have at least X percent of color people or from different ethnicity and that's it. And they need to impose that to their recruiting team because that's, you know, positive selection has one impact is that you create this attraction pool of, of diversity that will after fuel your company with diverse people, but you need to initiate it. And this is not gonna come by accident. You really need to do it. Just be very conscious. Uh, yeah. And I, this is a question that'll be for both of you, but let's start with you, Sarah. You know, to what extent are the inequalities within tech do you feel you know, not just uh, a tech problem, but kind of a, a reflection of wider problems uh, within society in terms of how, you know, how women are treated or how women, uh, the opportunities that women have. Same thing for people of color. Do you feel that tech is, is essentially just a reflection of the wider inequalities that we see within society? Or is there something special about the sector? Um. I don't know. I, I think I think you know that that was the tech came from geek that were in their garage and built you know built the tech world and they were like mostly white people, young male that were working with your computer in their garage. That's super. That's horrible what I'm saying, but you know it starts like that and then you know it's like continued like that for for, for a while. Um, is it is it reflecting really the rest of the world? Um, I think you have, in terms of uh, problematics that we have about sexual harassment, etc. I think I'm pretty sure that this exists in the tech world as well. Probably less than than you know in in the in other other area. You know, we don't have like all the different uh, problems uh, about. Uh, but the gender the, the gender equity, yes, we have this problem. Like probably more yes. prominent. Than in any any other field, yeah, you don't see that in hospitals, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but you so we see it a lot in tech. So I think the tech world has its own issues, and uh, and uh, yeah, and and but I, I yeah I strongly believe that there is a lot of uh, of um, there is a lot of opportunities right now for women. There is a lot of education to be done on the on both direction. I think a lot of leaders are really conscious that they need to have more women in upper position and in tech, 
in general and in a proposition in tech. Um, but you have also a lot of education to do to women uh, that need to go and apply to, to this position at the same time. So I think, I think you know, it's not just the, the responsibility of, of the, the person that is hiring. There is also a responsibility that, uh, that is on the shoulders of women that don't necessarily apply to this position either. And we see that. So, so they need to just trust yourself and apply to the, to the cost and the position. You know, you, you, the, the, this, this exists as well. I see it a lot. You know, I've, I have interviews with, I had interviews with women and that's only with women. I, I remember they come and they just tell you every, all the reason why you should not hire them. Like, what are you doing? Seriously? Like, <laughs> okay, now you explain me why I should not hire you. Could you please tell me why you are coming here? You know, so there is, there is a lot of, of uh, there is a lot of education to be done as well. Uh, for women to trust themselves a little bit more, like a lot more, uh, to take the lead, uh, maybe misconception, maybe a lot of effort to be done by the tech world also to 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 have a better um, family work balance. That That's, is happening. You know. I, can't, I can't help with, with what you said just a minute ago of thinking of Sheryl Sandberg's, of course, you know, lean in a little bit of, I, I hear that in what you're saying. Perfect. Phil, why don't you give your take uh, on whether you feel that tech or the problems of racial diversity within tech are simply a microcosm of society, or maybe there's something special about tech that's, you know, causing certain failures to, for, for Black people and other people of color, you know, to be represented properly. Yeah, I, I don't know that it's a, a microcosm, but it's a continuation right? Uh, our, our society today was built on the uh, false idea of white supremacy, right? Uh, and, and, and this is just a continuation of that, the sort of idea that the only people who can create, you know, these huge tech companies are, you know, white men, <laughs> right? And, and so it's a continuation yeah. of that. And, and um, the, 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 the barriers of access, right, that exist now came were created recently, right? The whole tech space was only created recently. And, and yet those barriers remain. Like even though this was a new space and there, and there was potential for a completely different approach to things, like everything that was before, it just you know, got shifted right into, right into tech. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily a microcosm, I'd say it's a continuation. Yeah, yeah. And you don't feel there's anything specifically about tech that makes the problem more acute then? I mean, I, th I think Sarah, you, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm not paraphrasing the right way, but it sounds to me like you are fe feeling that there is something about tech, you know, kind of its history, its association with quote unquote geeks that does sort of make it a little bit, there is something that makes it more acute. And I think it is borne out in the statistics, but if I'm not mistaken, Phil, you don't feel necessarily there's anything about tech that maybe makes that problem more acute then. I, I think it's society's perspective about tech that makes yeah. it really so it's the idea, like how many, how many, uh, uh, you know, black founded unicorns do you know of? Can't think right. Of there aren't that. that there aren't that many. There there, yeah. there there are some, but there aren't that many. Right. And so, and so that you know, it, it's even weird to even think of that. It's like, oh, I hadn't, you know, yeah, I don't know any, you know, black founded unicorns out there. You don't think about it, but subconsciously it registers, and you know. And so when you think, oh, such and such founder, uh, uh, you know, has none, their company now is a billion dollar valuation. In your mind, you're not you're not thinking a black person. You're automatically thinking a white person. That's person pops in your head. First thing that pops into mind, right? Yep. And 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 so it's it's society's idea and perception of what tech is that right. that just just continues right if we don't change that narrative if we don't if we don't find um you know th those sort of black examples of of you know very successful tech entrepreneurs and investors and, and whatnot if we don't do that and 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 champion them then it's the idea is going to continue to perpetuate whether whether it's in good faith or bad faith you understand yeah. what i'm saying yeah no that makes sense it, it, it's, i'm not talking about intention here i'm talking about like what actually what actually happens 
I think that's also just, you know, my, I guess you could say hot take on, on anything regarding diversity. One of the most interesting parts of the discussion is about intentionality. And I think it's the part that people who are maybe hostile to the discussion, you know, have to be, I don't want to say persuaded about, but they have to understand that it, it isn't always about intentionality. We're not, no one's calling, you know, systemic racism doesn't require people to be intentionally or consciously racist. It's about a system that's been created that has that perpetuates a certain racist outcome or a particular sex uh, sexist outcome, for example, in, in systemic sexism. So uh, it's a very interesting topic around uh, intentionality in these types of situations. Um, but there is there is some, yeah. there is something actually I just want to to yeah, sure of course. There, there is something also about like choice of of community or uh, of gender. Um, you know, I, I went to this, uh, we, we went to this competition of French founders, and this is like French from France companies, right? Yeah. And I was amazed about the numbers of companies around food. Okay, that's cultural thing, French and food, you know, you are French, you're speaking about food. Th there is something actually about a lot of entrepreneur women were more like attracted by social things than really tech things. So there is actually a, a probably a natural tendency to lie into or to go into something that resonates more about your culture, about, you know, like into, that is, so when you're becoming an entrepreneur, you know, probably when you're a woman, the first thing you don't think is about artificial intelligence, you know, like it's like, you know, maybe now more, but before when, you know, like the generation of my mother, when they were like saying, oh, I'm going to have my own company, all their culture, all their education, everything, we're not like predisposing them like to go into like computers, mm -hmm. was predisposing them to go into something else, right? Like French people are predisposed to go into food stuff, you know? Yeah. So I'm wondering whether, you know, and, and whether the, you know, what's about the Asian culture? What's about, you know, the African culture? and so when when people have different culture, they have they have different um, different uh, things they will be more interested in, and that's probably you know caricature. I will say that in yeah. French, but but there is something also in there. But that comes down to again to society's perspective on those things, right? It, like if mm. so, so the French. I mean, I've, I've lived in France. I understand French culture very well. You know, the, the, the French love of food, right, is very true, but it's also perpetuated exponentially by the other people who aren't French. Like, all oh, the French love food, all oh, the French love food. And so, you know, all right, I'm, 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 I'm six foot four, I'm, I'm, I'm half black, right? So when I was a kid, everyone was like, oh, you're a basketball player. And I didn't really play basketball. Well, I became a basketball player, right? <laughs> you know, if enough people look at you and say, do you play basketball? You kind of want to pick up a basketball and say, yeah, I can play, you know? So, so uh, it, it's, it's also, yes, of course, there's the internal culture, but there's also the external culture, right? When we think yeah. of tech hubs, we don't think Africa, even though there's amazing tech hubs going on in, in Africa, right? Mm -hmm. We think Asia because, I mean, we can go into the history about this, but really when, you know, uh, Japan got uh, taken over after the Second World War and, and we're told, okay, you can't develop any weapons. Well, they developed an entire technology system that, that thrived, right? And other countries in the area did the same. And, and, and so you can look at sort of the historical context of those things and understand why society evolved in that way. But you can also intentionally say, hey, this community, why don't we get involved in this? Right, I, I think that, that there's potential for that as well, as opposed to strictly relying on historically what your community did, you know, mm -hmm. so. Hmm. All right, uh, so, you know, a quick question here, and actually I think uh, Phil, you've made uh, allusions to it. So I wanna start with you on this. How much do you feel that the question about diversity is really one about culture? Like where does culture come into this? Um, how do you change a culture? Just if you could expound on culture and diversity around race and how those two can, how you can create a culture that's, that's helpful to that discussion. So when you say culture, do you mean like company culture? Yeah, company culture, exactly. Okay. Company culture. So sorry, so can you just say that question? I, I wasn't sure what culture was. So I yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. Just how would you explain, how would you explain how culture can be helpful to creating a diverse workforce? What kind of cultures, for instance, 
might attract a diverse workforce? What kind of cultures might actually go out of their way to accommodate that and make sure that it happens? Well, I mean, diversity in and of itself is, is a, a core value, right? Right. Uh, that, that should then define the, the culture of your, of your yeah business right so if you say okay my business's core values are uh you know diversity you know uh innovation and whatever the, then you build things around that uh, that those core values and that becomes your culture right you, you you try to well and i'm saying this is how you know ideally things are done it's not always how things are done sometimes companies just pop up and it's like no one's thinking about that and it's like cool like whatever after that but um yeah, diversity in and of itself is like there's companies that have a culture of diversity, like MIMS, who have a culture of, <laughs> you know, gender diversity. It's it's in the fabric of what they do, and it's an intentional choice. Uh, uh, so it, all it takes is intention, right? If you aren't intentional about your company culture, it'll simply reflect your your founding team. If your founding team is all white, then then then, and you're not intentional about culture, the likelihood is that your whole uh, workforce is going to end up or the majority of your workforce is going to end up being a reflection of you because it's just a psychological normality for everyone we are comfortable and attracted to people who reflect us right <laughs> period yeah. and, and it's not again it's not a, it's not a, a a negative thing it's just a fact right we are attracted to people who look and talk and and, and move and 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 <laughs> like us right uh, and so if we're not intentional about about that, then ultimately uh, the company will just end up perfect, reflecting exactly who, who the founders look like, typically. And how do you feel about that question, Sarah? What, uh, I mean, certainly the culture of diversity, that's a, I think that's a very important point. What do you feel about a culture that attracts diversity or that leads to a more diverse outcome? And what's that role of company culture in, in leading to those types of outcomes? So I, as I said previously, um, this choice this is a choice this is the de deliberate choice that needs to be done by uh, the leader to 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 generate this uh, this culture um and that's something actually that you that you need to decide uh and that's not something that you're going to be forced to be doing or that you're going to be forced because if you don't do that your company is going to be dead um so so you really need, you know, the leaders need to say, okay, that's it. You know, I, I that's something I want to do. I, I need to move that into, because that's normal. And I, you know, everybody will feel better after. So we need to move this and make the effort it takes so that we reach this, uh, this equity um, and this balance. So, so if they don't decide it, you know, it's not like tomorrow company that will not reach 50%. Uh, so we, so gender balance uh, will be less successful or will be less impactful or, you know, there is no real evidence that, make, that will make your company less successful if you're all composed by men or all composed by women. You know, there is nothing that says that the company that is really well balanced is more efficient than the company that is not, right? But I think we all agree, and actually we all agree that you know, within the group of people, and because and 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 a company is a community at the same time. You know, you have this nice group of people. You know, these things are becoming more fluid if you're like more equilibrated, more representative of the entire society, and that's just so. Uh, I think you know that that needs to be like a more like a philosophical decision yeah. that needs to be taken by the leaders. And, and I think uh, it's interesting that you say that because, um, and this kind of co goes back to your question, Patrick, about whether there's a difference in tech. When you think about startups, right, the 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 the, the duration of life of the startup is 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 short, right? There's a there's a high failure rate, and in that time. Founders are focused on, on creating a viable business. And, and, and like Sarah said, uh, diversity isn't one of those things that will make or break your, your uh, a company in the first you know, five or 10 years. It won't make or break it. I, I, I think that, that you know, there's sufficient amount of data to show that diverse 
the lead companies, you know, create enough uh, <laughs> in terms of innovation to, to, to start in that with that. But really there's, like she said, there's no like tangible, like, yeah, if you're just white guys, you're, you're going to fail. That's not true. We've, <laughs> they built all of tech. <laughs> yeah. So, so I do think that it's particular to the startup environment that, um, because companies come and go so quickly, um, and, and the failure rate is so high, people aren't focused on a metric that isn't actually gonna, you know, help them right now grow their company. And, uh, you know, having spoken to a lot of like early stage startups, that's, it's kind of like, okay, we, we, we would like to do that. But, you know, we're, we're worried about marketing, we're worried about sales, we're worried about, <laughs> you know, all these things that are going to keep us alive uh, uh, tomorrow, and then, you know, fundraising and this and that. So, that might be something specific to, to tech startups uh, uh, that may not be as obvious in other places that have a longer duration. And actually, I but wanted you, to ask you, Phil, about this, you know, the uh, putting aside, you know, I like, I think everyone wants to, to, to kind of at least understand what the data might suggest. And you've alluded to it, you know, putting altruism aside, we all know that it's, it's altruistically good, uh, <laughs> good and moral to have a diverse company. But what are the actual selfish benefits for having a, a, a more diverse company do, do more diverse companies do better yeah so there's been a lot of studies large scale studies i mean uh boston consulting group uh did a few deloitte did a few mckinsey did a few um i mean anyone you can think of has has, has done it and and it what these large-scale global studies show is that yes i mean companies that are more diverse at a at a, at a top level at every level really outperform their competitors, in, in, especially in terms of in, in, innovation related products. And, and, and so, you know, after this many reports that show this on, you know, independent studies, it's kind of like, well, <laughs> okay, yeah. we might want to listen. And there's, and there's a sort of, um, yeah, a, a, a business argument for-, for Now for the question is, are they more diverse because they have a better leadership? And then also they have a better tech because they have a better leadership. <laughs> and then the one is not the cause of the other one. It's just- Yeah, it's all about because... causation and correlation and, and, and yeah, but, but I, I think there's enough interesting, interesting data, <laughs> you know, to, to point at least to try it. Like it hasn't, you know, <laughs> to try it more often, you know? So uh, um, yeah, no, I agree with you though that yeah, it, like correlation doesn't 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 mean causation uh, um, but... because because it takes an effort seriously it takes really that you really you know focus on it uh, to 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 be able to be to reach you know balance and to be more diverse and you know like it requires a significant amount of effort to do it so companies that did that really made this effort to do it and so you can suspect that they will have made a lot of other efforts that are really related to the quality of the service or to the quality of the product that they are that they are generating at the same time right so mm. being a scientist for me i will never be able to exclude the fact that these two points are correlated because they all have the same origin you have strong leaders that are visionary that really feels and give this as an objective for their company and at the same time, because they are visionaries and they are good leaders, they have good products. But so you think their yeah. ability to execute <laughs> is, is, yeah. is ultimately uh, to execute on 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 the diversity front is an indicator that they can execute on all the other fronts. That's interesting. On, on the I other things, that's very interesting. But at the end, so for us, actually, you know, and and particularly right now, uh, reaching balance. So actually, being able to attract more women talent is actually will help us will help us develop better product why because it's super complicated to find great talent so if we can attract them because women are more attracted to come at means because there are more women at means then you know like you know then that's a good plan i'll say that like that that's a good thing that we do that right mm -hmm. so that there will be an impact of attracting very excellent talent Women talent, being able to retain them into our corporation because we are gendered balanced. So, well, you could also make the argument not just in terms, of, just to have my own little hot take here. I mean, not just in terms of execution, but in terms of also just being a more conscious, you know, leader in general. The fact that you're, you know, you can kind of step out of yourself, uh, 
sort of step out of your own perspective and imagine, you know, how a more diverse team could help, you know, might have spillover effects in terms of other ways that you run your business. Um, but yeah, it's very interesting discussion about the causation part. Um, and last question here uh, that I have prepared, uh, you know, what are some resources that, that both of you could recommend to the audience? Uh, resources about diversity, uh, whether it's about, uh, you know, women's empowerment, whether it's about uh, racial justice, um, or about tech, or that touches on all of those subjects. Uh, Sarah, can you start that off? What, what would you have for the audience? Or I can go to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't prepare so. anything, so let me think about it. Phil, do you sure. have any great I, I, I books I don't, to have any, <laughs> I don't have anything prepared, per se, but... Um, you know, the Brookfield Institute has put together some some really interesting reports, and a lot of the data that I that I cite comes from their their report called "Who Are Canada's Tech Workers," and so they they uh, do a good breakdown in terms of gender gender breakdown and, and racial breakdown, and and, and uh, that was really a, a an important uh, a report for Canada because um, we're always citing U.S. data, right? Yeah. As opposed because we don't really know what's going on because we don't have we don't collect race based data properly in Canada, right? Um, and another thing I'd say that was pivotal for my uh, uh, um, philosophy on anti-racism was uh, Ibram X. Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. <laughs> um, it, it changed my perspective of, of how I approached, you know, racism and anti-racism. Um, so that was that was refreshing. Um, and and it's, a, it's a great uh, um, entry level sort of book yeah. in, into anti-racism. Perfect. And what about you, Sarah? Seriously? I don't know. <laughs> That's okay. I will pass on that one. Seriously. That's okay. That's um, okay. Yeah. I don't know what I will recommend as a reading. Uh, nope. Podcast? No, maybe. no podcast? Okay. podcast? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, is, there, there are a lot of actually uh, of podcasts. I only could, could post the ones that um, there is. Um, and I'm tired, so I will never be That's able okay. to find the name of the thing. You're only so, running a company I mean, here, Sarah. There's, so. yeah. <laughs> there's been a lot of reports on, on, on gender diversity in Canada. Oh, yeah, there you are know, uh, the, Really, if, 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 if someone's interested, it's, it's just a Google away. Uh, yeah. it, it's not hard to find the, the really exactly. good information and reports on, on gender gender diversity in, in, in tech. And just look at the reports, you know, like Stand Up Ventures and all the funds that are really specifically founding uh, women uh, led companies, they they generated significant amounts of materials about, you know, the performance of these companies, etc. Because uh, of course they have like to get money to fund companies that are led by women. So so they had like to do a lot of uh, this exercise uh, to to prove it. Yeah. All right. Well, um, on behalf of everyone here, I want to uh, thank both of our guests. Um, you know, I hope well, I invite everyone to just take themselves off of mute for one second. We live in a COVID age. I think this is the only way we can yeah. give you guys a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> so, you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so, so much. And uh, I invite anyone in the audience. Um, does anyone in the audience have anything they want to ask uh, or anything they want to contribute for that matter? No? All right. Well, uh, let's see here. Thanks. Taking away to be more conscious. Perfect. Well, uh, in that case, uh, thank you so much to especially our guests, but also to the audience members. Uh, thank you so much and have yourselves a great evening. I hope we're all walking away just a little bit more enlightened. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank all you. Right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.